With that, welcome to Inside This Week, opening edition of Big Ten Today. Rick Pizzo joined by Dave Wanston. We've been spending a lot of time together lately talking about the draft. The draft is now gone, and I'm assuming this chair, this seat is a lot cooler than the seats you were sitting in when you were coaching on the Monday after you make all those selections. Well, you know what? It's, it's like recruiting in college. I mean, everybody right now is sitting there saying we got the best draft we've ever had you know our guys are so good we're so fast we're so much better and team. at least half of them are wrong and, oh at least half of them are wrong so uh it's a matter of really uh, did, did we win the press conference did we get the fans and the people who are going to buy those tickets and the marketing people did we get them excited because if you didn't do that at this point in the season, you're in trouble. Hey, everybody's unbeaten until opening weekend in the <laughs> NFL. That's right. It is the big story of this day right now, the big story in all of sports, the end of the NFL draft. And what manifests, we'll see come the regular season. 42 total Big Ten players were selected, four going in the first round, led by Marvin Harrison, who went fourth overall to Arizona Michigan sent 18 players to the Combine. That was an all-time record. They had a school record. 13 of those players drafted. 11 of the 14 current Big Ten schools had at least a player drafted. Obviously, the four incoming schools were part of this year's draft as well. Let's discuss some Big Ten players landing at spots where we think they could have immediate impact. We know Marvin Harrison will be that guy as right. long as Kyler Murray stays healthy. The J.J. McCarthy pick, though, is fascinating because the Vikings don't really have a quarterback right now that you look at and say, well, he's going to be the opening day starter. We knew for a long time Minnesota was interested in McCarthy. There was talk they could even trade up higher than the 10th spot right. if there was a risk of losing him. He steps into a situation surrounded by talent, surrounded by a staff that likely believes this is going to be the guy. Absolutely. You, you know, they have Sam Darnold on the, uh, on the roster right now, uh, former Trojan, but he's bounced around the league. But everyone's talking about Caleb Williams at the Bear, Bears, what a great supporting cast he has. And, oh, he can come in as a rookie. It's not a typical situation for a rookie where the team is horrible around him. Well, J.J. McCarthy, I love this situation for him. When you think about it, he's going in the door. He's got a tight end in, in Hawkinson, okay, who plays as good as anybody in the league. You've got Jefferson on one side. You've got Justin Jefferson on one side. You've got Jordan Addison, another number one pick, on the other side. You've got Hawkinson tight end, and then they sign Aaron Jones, the great running back, the lifeline of the Packers for the last five years. So, and, and, then, and then take a look at the offensive line. Everybody says, oh, they got two number one picks, two number two picks. I, th I hope they start J.J. day one. That's what I would do. I would not waste any time with anybody else. Put the kid in there. He's ready to go, and let's move on down the road. So, from the coach's perspective, what's the risk-reward there? Because, yes, you want to get him in, get him meaningful reps. Maybe he has a, a little bit of rope, but at the same time, you don't want to mess with a young man's confidence if that early season schedule is tough. And I understand, J.J.'s a very mature guy, a very confident guy, but there certainly is a little bit of risk starting a rookie in week one. There is, and, and I was when I was at the Bears, Brett Favre started you know, his first year, and I was at the Dolphins, uh, Tom Brady started. And in both of these situations, one, Mike Holmgren, offensive-minded head coach, uh, Belichick defense, they both had kind of a similar philosophy. A lot of screens, Rick, a lot of high percentage throws, uh, balanced running game. This is how they got Brady to be confident, Brett Favre to be confident right off the bat. So that's on the head coach. You know, the head coach of the Vikings, Kevin O'Connell, he's an offensive guy. It's on you to make sure that you put a good game plan in that J.J. can be successful because he's got talent around him. Would have been nice, though, if Favre and Brady were actually on your team throwing for you, not throwing against you, right? Coach, I had nightmares and still do. Still do. Looks like you sleep pretty well. <laughs> there was a second-round pick that I think was a steal, and that is Johnny Newton. I I'm not sure why the Illinois defensive lineman wasn't chosen in the first round. He has the measurables. He has amazing hands. He was as productive as any player at his position. Obviously, somebody in the first round didn't believe he was worth a pick. But with 36, the Washington Commanders get Newton. 
I think, Dave, he's a guy who steps in. I think he starts from day one. I think he's an impact player from day one. I, I agree. You're right on point, Rick. He's, he's what I put as a playmaker. And when you get defensive tackles, okay, tackles, now not linebackers, and they can make plays like Johnny Newton can, that's what I love. That's that guy's I want in my scheme. And everybody was comparing him to the kid from Texas, Byron Murphy, who got drafted earlier in the first round. He's bigger, maybe stronger. But Johnny had twice the sacks, twice the tackles. Got to make the, the plays. Last. Make plays. Make plays. And guess where he's at? He's in there at Washington. Dan Quinn is the new head coach there, a defensive-minded guy who loves to rotate. When he was at Dallas, he was rotating those defensive linemen in, you know, five, six, seven guys in. So Johnny Newton, he's going to get an opportunity early. And when, a, and when a head coach is the defensive guy, that's a real plus for a young guy on defense coming in and playing early. And we've seen the impact that defensive tackles, especially as of late, I'm not saying that Johnny Newton is Aaron Donald because there's only one Aaron Donald, arguably the greatest tackle to ever play the position. But, Dave, as the game kind of changes a little bit, that position has become more important in the new-look NFL. Absolutely. No, no question. With three, four, five receivers, you need defensive backs covering. So the guys up front got to do more. Yeah. And in this Washington situation, uh, obviously Montez Sweat is gone. He's one of their stars. Chase Young was one of their stars. Ohio State, he's gone. So there's some real opportunity for a young guy like Johnny to come into Washington and, uh, and make some noise. And I know folks in the Big Ten that played against Illinois over the last couple of years, happy yep. that he is in the NFL, not having to deal with him and Keith Randolph on that terrific defensive line that Illinois had a year ago. Cooper DeJean has long been a fascinating prospect. He's obviously a cornerback who could potentially slide to safety in the NFL, likely why he was a second, not a first-round pick. But also, Dave, a guy that I think with the Eagles will probably be an immediate impact player on special teams, not just defense. I, I, I agree with you. He was a very difficult one to evaluate, in my opinion, watching all the tape on him, because he was a corner, listed as a corner. He's got the speed to be the corner. He's got the intelligence but, you know, does he have the hips and stuff? Because he's a physical player. So you kind of want him everywhere. Last year, the Eagles, they had the pass rush. They needed coverage guys. And today, I look, I'm looking at the depth chart. One day, he's already listed as a starting nickelback. So they put him in there, and you might say, oh, it's just a nickelback. No, no, nickelbacks change. You know this, Rick. Everybody's playing three receivers, four receivers. The nickelbacks are playing 80% of the snaps. And what do you got to do? You got to be the smartest guy in the secondary because you're playing some linebacker. You're playing some secondary. You got to be a good tackler and physical. You're playing the pass. But if they hand it off, you got to come up and play the run. So there's more on the nickelback on these NFL teams today, responsibility-wise, than there's ever been in the past. And then you just said it. They got the bonus of the special teams on top of it. So he, he's, they got big plans for him. Uh, there's no question about that. And I think it was a great pick. I mean, they're going to be he, – he's going to love it. They got a good team, and he, he's going to be real successful there. Some of our Canadian rock fans watching out there got excited when you kept saying Nickelback. No, not that Nickelback, the position in <laughs> NFL Nickelback. And you brought it up, the expanded NFL offense, everybody going on the outside. The term Nickelback just means an extra defensive back. I would argue what? With most defenses, you're playing with that extra DB on 70, 75 percent of your snaps. Almost 80 last year. Unbelievable. Yep. So you go in as a nickelback, you are basically part of that starting secondary as long as you are the starting nickelback, which is where Cooper DeGene is listed right now. You go a little bit further down into the draft, and obviously there was so much offense early, then we got some defense, and then we went back to offense. Braylon Allen is a guy who was productive from the jump, came in as a 17-year-old yep. true freshman at Wisconsin, at least in age, because he was a grown blank man when you looked at him with pads on, had a lot of carries for the, this Wisconsin team. So I wasn't surprised that he decided to enter the draft with eligibility left. You want to have tread on that tire if you're going to be a running back. He comes into a New York Jets team that needs to be able to run the football, and he joins a very similar running back in their backfield in Brees Hall. Yeah, and I think it's a good compliment. You know, when, when you look back what happened uh, – at Green Bay, and obviously Aaron Rodgers is the quarterback, so they're trying to simulate that a little bit. And when at Green Bay, they had Aaron Jones and they had A.J. Dillon, 
the big, stronger guy. And they used them both. It was the one-two yep. punch. They got Brees Hall, as you said, who's more of a scat, big play guy. And I think Breeland will come in there, and he's going to have a real role. He, they can use him on protection and pass block him because of his size and strength, short yardage, goal line. I mean, there's going to be a lot of situations that he really will have the best opportunity, even over Brees Hall. And then you got Aaron Rodgers. What did they got? They, they, they signed three free agents. They drafted uh, Fashan Yu out of Penn State yep. in the first round. So you got a rookie there. You got a couple. Free, so how do you help your offensive line, Rick? You run the football. How do you help your all-pro Hall of Fame quarterback, Aaron Rodgers, coming off of Achilles, run the football? So I think – and you got a defensive-minded head coach, Robert Sala. So he ain't going to throw it 50 times. Breland Allen's going to have some real opportunities. Well, there. you also mentioned quarterbacks that can kill defenses by making right decisions and checking it down. Braylon Allen really worked hard his last couple of years at Wisconsin to become a better pass catcher mm. out of the backfield. In the NFL today, if you have a running back – who can jump outside when the quarterback gets in trouble and then makes plays with a short little screen pass, that's not just a glorified run. It's been a big part of the NFL offense the last couple of seasons. Ab absolutely. You, 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 the more you can do, obviously, the more value to have. And in this situation, and with his size and strength, you know he can pass block. So if you've got a guy that you don't have to pull out of the game uh, every time you're going to throw a pass because he can catch and he can block, that checks another box for him. And, and he's, he's in a good situation. The Jets are going to make some noise this year, and he's going to have a lot of fun up there. All right, so we've talked offense. We've talked defense. Now let's talk punters. Every Iowa football fan's <laughs> favorite topic. Torrey Taylor, the best punter in the country without question the last couple of years, Ends up just down the road from our studios here in Chicago. He'll punt for the Bears at Soldier Field. May all your punts be downwind <laughs> at maybe one of the windiest locations in all of the NFL. But I think it says everything, Dave. To have a punter chosen in the fourth round, the Bears know how important field position can be. Yep. And this guy flipped the field time and time again in his college career. Well, you know what it does? It takes a lot of pressure off of your offensive coordinator and your quarterback in forcing yourself to go for it on fourth down. You're backed up. What do we do? Do we take a chance? Because if we punt it, you know, they're going to get the ball at the 50-yard line. No, we're going to punt it, okay? And we're going to back them up. I mean, his, you know, it, it, numbers are crazy. We know the hang time. The one that gets me is he had 32 punts where he was punting inside the 20. 29 of them were fair catch. In, which means your, their offense and our defense, is, they're going to be stop, starting at the 10, 5, wherever. I mean, that is such – you just said hidden yardage and special teams. It is such a big weapon. And then half these guys we'll, – he didn't get drafted uh, from someplace in California or Florida. So as far this as – This is a great point. Being in Chicago and the elements. I mean, we sat here and watched the game with Iowa where it's snowing and blizzarding, and he's just out there banging the ball. That's perfect for Soldier Field. And then the other thing, he's kicked in bigger stadiums in college than he's going to in the NFL. Everyone says, well, these kickers get nervous. You know, you got the NFL crowd. He – Penn State, Ohio State, Michigan. The Bears got the smallest stadium in the NFL. They got, what, 60,000? For now. For oh, now. Well, oh, oh, allegedly. Don't worry. He, by the time that gets built. Different he'll be, he'll be. conversation for a different time. <laughs> All right. From the past to the future, when Big Ten Today returns, Dave, on what's next for the Baker's dozen worth of Wolverines who heard their names called over the weekend. But first, it is year two for Luke Fickle in Madison. What changes should you expect to see on the field this season in Madtown? We'll ask the Badger headman right after this. Big Ten Today is presented by Gatorade. Wisconsin offered up its second scrimmage of the spring this past Saturday. Another chance to see that ongoing quarterback competition between Braden Locke and Tyler Van Dyke. Always a chance for the coaches as well to see some of the new guys, the early enrollees, how everybody mixes in with those veterans. And no one was watching more closely than our next guest. Wisconsin head coach Luke Fickle is joining us. It's Rick Pizzo and Dave Wanstead. Dave, because you're here, we call it coach speak, you know, because we have more than one coach on the show. Yes, you absolutely. Rolling with this? Ab no, that's the only reason we, yeah, we get these coaches. All right, we want to talk enough. some football. Hey, Luke, let's start with this. Before I let Dave go crazy with his questions, <laughs> what's the big picture look for you after spring? Uh, we're not done yet, so uh, I haven't uh, switched the gears to uh, figure out what the big picture looks like, but 
um, it's unique for us, you know, spring ends as the portal and a lot of different things. end. so, you know, we'll, we'll move into that recruiting and get ready for the summer stuff. But, um, I think more than anything, it's just, it's, it's year two. We gotta, we gotta do a better job at evaluating where we are and what we need to do, um, as we get working towards August and September. I thought it was interesting, Luke. I heard you after that spring scrimmage on Saturday say you felt like maybe there were some times last year that the moment was a little big, that the guys weren't exactly ready to embrace it and take it all over. How have you been addressing that in the offseason? Well, we didn't. We weren't live the, this weekend like a lot of teams in there. It's not a spring scrimmage, but 150-some uh, snaps of live tackling, live ball. A couple weeks ago, we had uh, probably about 100 snaps of live ball. Uh, last spring, I don't know that we went live. We went in the spring scrimmage or spring game. We went live with the twos. Um, so I think we've kind of refocused, kind of changed the mindset. Like, look, if you're going to get great at this game, you got to continue to play this game. And the things that we found out, unfortunately, in week one, two, three, and four was, you know, we didn't tackle real well in space defensively. And we struggled a little bit more in space with some of those things. We turned the ball over and created, uh, we gave up too many fumbles. And I think that had a lot to do with, you know, the preparation we had and, how often did you actually tackle and go live in those situations? And um, we won't be in that spot again, uh, I know, this year or, or ever in my in my career. Hey, Coach, just a football question here first. On offense, you know, I remember your teams at Cincinnati with, with Desmond Ritter, and I went back and looked at it. He carried the ball about eight or ten times a game, roughly. Uh, and, and then, you know, Tanner Mordecai last year, Mordecai, he was about the same, eight, ten times a game running the football, scrambles, whatever call plays. My question would be with Tyler Van Dyke, with, with the quarterbacks right now who are more of a passer, maybe it's just my opinion, maybe I'm wrong on this, uh, is, there, is, there, is the philosophy going to change at all depending on the quarterback, or are you committed to, hey, this is what – you know, we're going to do this is what Phil wants to do, and we're going to stay with it regardless who the quarterback is. Kind of where you at with the quarterback, the dual threat thing or not? Well, if there's any influence from me, which obviously there will be a little bit on offense, um, they will definitely have an option to uh, – we have the ability to run the football. I think that, you know, as defensive guys, I think the one thing that can be the great equalizer and, you know, makes you have to do a lot of preparation for is the quarterback run game. And whether it's a called quarterback run, whether it's a, you know, a read that's a, that possibly turns into a run. Um, there's no doubt that it will still be a part of a, of our offense. And I think the unique thing in Tyler Van Dyke's case, if you watch him in his first year, I think at Miami that he was a starter, he actually ran pretty well. Uh, I don't think in the, the, you know, the, the following two years or during his progression that he ran nearly as much. And I actually harassed him, I think, last week um, as he took off and ran a couple times in our, in our other scrimmage. I said, you look a lot more like you did as a freshman. And you're down to that weight that you were as a freshman. You're a lot stronger and you're running a lot better. And that's what we expect from you, you know, for your opportunities, whether they're six, seven, eight times a game, um, to take off and run, we, we have to be able to do this. We have to be able to extend plays, and you got to be able to create some things with your legs. Defensively, you added Alex Grinch. Now, he was with you guys, I believe, at Ohio State, right, for a little bit, and then uh, obviously USC. With the addition of him coming in, I know it was a co thing, you know, him and, him and Tress. Uh, defensively, is any scheme wise there, I guess, you know, or any, any philosophy changes there? I know obviously that's your. That's your wheelhouse there on defense. But uh, after last season, as you look at it, and, you know, we, we were always, okay, what do, what do we got to do offensively and defensively to, to win our conference? And do we need to make some adjustments? Did you see anything defensively that uh, major that you think you need to change? Well, two point. Uh, Alex and I never did overlap at Ohio State. Mm. Um, so we, we had, you know, only kind of knew each other through mutual people. Um, you know, so that's how the, 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 this, you know, kind of came about from, from some mutual friendships. Um, and then obviously just knowing of him at his time at, you know, not just USC, but Oklahoma as well. Um, Tress is, is our defensive coordinator and uh, that hasn't changed and that won't change. Um, but the great thing about Alex coming in, the great thing <clears throat> gives you just some different pers perspective. Uh, we were pretty average on defense last year. And we know we've got to do some things to become a lot better. I think last year in particular, you know, we were kind of bouncing a little bit back and forth between some of the three-man stuff and the four-man stuff and really trying to figure out 
who we are and what best suits, you know, for the talent that we've got. And um, we'll still have a, you know, a combination of both, but I think that, you know, I think we found our, our niche a little bit more um, and just a bit more of some of the four down stuff and what we can do with our outside linebackers from the line of scrimmage. Uh, but it's always great. You, you got a guy with the experience that Alex Grinch has, he can come in and, you know, this is who we are. This is what we do. This is where we want to grow. And now give us some different perspectives. Give us your eye, your vision, your things that you see, you know, from all of your experiences. And, and you know, we're not looking for, you know, some of the wholesale changes, but where and, and how do we make this thing go from, you know, average or good to, uh, you know, great or a hell of a lot better. I know that. Now, Luke, I know you're focused on the rest of spring. You probably haven't given much thought to the overall schedule. That, that's what we do. That's what fans do. But you have a fascinating schedule, right? You have Alabama at home in the non-con. I believe your first conference game is a road trip to one of the new members in USC. You also host Oregon. A lot of people believe they'll be in the mix for the Big, for the Big Ten at the end of the year. What's your kind of take on the big picture look schedule-wise and competitiveness and all the travel and all the difference that will go into year one of the Big Ten for you and the Badgers. Well, I appreciate it. I'm glad you brought those back up. Uh, when people ask, <laughs> sorry, us, really, I've heard. I know that they're out there. I, I, I don't know that that changes how we prepare. Um, so, so I tried to kind of put that in, in the back burner um, so that I at least can get a little bit of sleep. But we all knew this. I mean, we knew what we signed up for. Uh, you know, when we came here. We knew that the Big Ten was was going to continue to grow. Where was it going to really go to? What was it really going to look like? Um, we nobody really knew, but you knew it was going to grow, and you knew that to be in the Big Ten and to be in the SEC, you were going to be at the forefront of everything that's going on. So, you, not that you're going to complain about you know what has transpired, and and all of a sudden the you know the schedule which you have, you just got to embrace it. And you know, like I said, it doesn't change the way that we go about the things that we're doing, but it's it is a great reminder for everybody within our program to understand like. You know, when we talk about winning a championship, when we talk about playing for a championship, you got to know what that means. And it doesn't just mean the winning the West like it has for so many years. It means playing Alabama. It means playing USC. It means playing Oregon. It means playing Penn State. And if you don't understand that, then you're going to be in the wrong place. And you don't understand what, you know, how we have to go about all the things that we do from the way that which we lead, the expe expectations we have on a daily basis. If you're not, willing and, and want that smoke as some people say then then this is uh this is not going to be the right place for you all right luke we're gonna we're gonna finish here by going a little bit i think off the beaten path i have some inside sources from your time when you were an assistant in columbus and okay. i've been told that during some to the death really intense racquetball games that you are so competitive that there were perhaps what's the best way for me to phrase this, perhaps some bending of the rules or some questionable calls. Now, I'm getting this inside information from a certain former All-American linebacker whose name, of course, I will not mention on the show other than saying it was James Laurinaitis. <laughs> well, when both of those guys would play against me, it'd be two on one. Um, <laughs> and I still don't think that they ever did beat me. But if it ever got close, you know, that obstruction you know, you find out what people are made of when they stand along that edge that they kind of hold the line over there on by the by the wall and you put one of those racquetballs square in the middle of their back. And if they squeal, you know, you got <laughs> if they don't squeal. Then, you know, this is going to be a long game. Dave, do you ever play racquetball? With I your love players when I you're a head coach. Not with the players, but I love playing. Absolutely. You, you still playing, Luke? You, is that still part no, of No, I, I don't even know if they have a racquetball court here. I, <laughs> I, uh, I would love to uh, get back to that because. I think those smaller spaces are, are a little bit better for me nowadays. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I do like to kind of find out what you got with the, the people that you're playing against. And there's different ways, especially in that small quarters, uh, to figure that out. Just a note to anybody who ever is lucky enough to play racquetball against Wisconsin head coach Luke Fickle. I would go full pads just in case. Stay in, the middle, saying, stay in the middle of the court. I'm too. just saying. Yeah, hey, don't, don't stand along that edge, man. Don't, don't be blocking my line. It's you gotta you gotta find out if they'll move or if they'll uh, if they'll squeal or not. Oh, awesome stuff, Luke. We appreciate you talking football and some non-football stuff with us as always. Best of luck to you and the Badgers for the rest of the spring. Look forward to seeing you on the field this fall. Appreciate. It. Thanks, guys. See you, coach. Oh, so much fun. Let's turn our attention to men's lacrosse next. Top seed Johns Hopkins opening its conference tourney Thursday. We'll catch up with Blue Jays headman and Big Ten Coach of the Year Peter Milliman when Big Ten Today returns.
Welcome back to Big Ten. Today we have reached the semifinal stage in both the women's and men's Big Ten lacrosse tournaments. A couple of upsets on the women's side in the quarters. Rutgers advancing to the semis. They'll play number two overall seed Penn State. And the top seed Northwestern takes on Johns Hopkins. In the men's tournament bracket, it's all chalk. See on the bottom of your screen, it's Maryland-Penn State. That's the 2-3 matchup. Michigan advances with its win in the quarterfinals. The Wolverines set to take on the outright regular season champ and top seed, Johns Hopkins. Time for today's big interview. And is the head coach of the Johns Hopkins Blue Jays, Peter Milliman, joining us, also recently named the Big Ten Coach of the Year. So, Peter, first and foremost, congrats to you on the award. The team on an amazing run as you kind of reflect back a little bit, what's been the golden thread for the team so far this season? I uh, appreciate that. Thank you. I, I would probably say more than anything is uh, is is the leadership, senior leadership, um, you know, guys, just determination and grit to, to keep competing and, and working for each other. I think they've done a great job of that so far. And, and you know, we're looking forward to, to keep fighting on. How has that leadership kind of manifested itself on the field as you have so many contributors who are veterans who've been through this the last couple of years with your program? I think more than anything, it comes through in the communication in between plays. Uh, a lot of times it's, it's uh, you know, in, the, in, the, in between the quarters, the half times, it's the sidelines in between shifts, uh, timeouts where, you know, the, the voices uh, are coming from the guys and not from the staff all the time. Uh, you know, there's been plenty of scenarios where, you know, some of the captains or even some of the, you know, the other seniors will, you know, look at us and say, you know, can I take this one? Is this, you know, I got something to say. I want to, I want to, you know, chime in. And, you know, we just step back and let them grab the huddle. And um, I think those are great, great places to be when you're coaching a team that, that has a lot of guys that, you know, have a voice and, and want to continue to, to, to lead whenever they can. Obviously, we've seen that leadership come through during this fantastic run late in the season through the Big Ten. Overall, you're 10 and three. You're considered to be one of the best teams in the country. But among those three losses, all three are one goal games and two actually came in overtime, all non-conference, all against really quality competition. How did those experiences kind of steal you guys and get you even more ready for Big Ten play? Um. You know, I, I mean, each of them was a little bit different, but I think if you start with, you know, our first game of the season was an overtime loss to Denver, and, and I thought we really learned a bit about ourselves there and how we can stay more composed down the stretch and, and you know, not try and be too much of a bully. We got to stay composed throughout the game and be disciplined uh, so we're not in the penalty box and, and we're able to make, you know, quality decisions and execute when it's essential. So, uh, you know, I think each of those, you know, has, has brought its own, uh, you know, learning lessons to the team. But um, I think because of that leadership, because of the commitment from the guys to, to really dive into that stuff, they wanted to make sure that it wasn't, you know, just a, a loss that motivated us because of frustration or because of, uh, you know, because of the negative influence. We wanted to learn from it, wanted to dissect it and then and then get better from it. And I think, um, you know, they've they presented those opportunities. I think we've done a decent job of that, but, you know, obviously we, we got a lot more out of us. Your team has done a fantastic job of executing as well, and the talent is there. You have a first-team All-Big Ten selection at three different levels. So let's start on attack. Garrett Degnan is one of the top ten nationally in points per game. What makes him so dangerous? Uh, you know, consistency. He's a captain. He's a two-time captain for us. Um, you know, he's. I think he's got the longest goal-scoring streak in the country. He just shows up to work every day. Um, he really fights hard. He's. You know, he values the possessions and doesn't. Uh, you know, he's not a high-risk uh, type of player. He really, you know, kind of grinds it out. He he gets his hands free whenever possible. But, um, you know, he's he's a he's a tough competitor. He's a great shooter um, and an excellent leader. On defense, Scott Smith, also a first-teamer. He has 50 ground balls. That's the most in the league for any non-face-off specialist. How does he help you, not just on the back end, but also in that transition from defense to the offensive attack? Yeah, I mean, we we, we probably could use Scott more than we do. We you just got to be careful about overusing him at times because I, I would put him anywhere we could, uh, you know, we could benefit. We put him on face-off wings. He's taken draws before. Um, you know, he a lot of times he's covering the, the other team's top player, but um he's a tough at you know athletic kid he runs through ground balls full speed he uh he attacks the net when he gets over the midline um you know he's he's a real you know heartbeat type guy the guys uh you know they, they respond to him he's 
he's got a lot of emotion the way he plays and uh you know just a, a fantastic uh, teammate and uh, and leader for us and if your opposing team does get a good look you have chase erlin inside the cage he had at least a dozen saves in four of your five big 10 wins how do you describe not just his level of play but what his consistency at that position has meant to your success I think a lot of it with Chase starts, you know, with his voice and, and his, uh, you know, his leadership uh, in communicating through through the defense, you know, throughout the sidelines in between, uh, like we said, in between quarters and, and timeouts and things like that. Um, you know, he's a, he's an everyday guy at practice. He's always bringing that energy, that competitive fire um, and, and really marries himself with the defense and what they're trying to do. Um, so I, I think, you know, he's got a, 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 a great skill set when it comes to his uh you know fundamentals in the cage things like that but uh he's he's probably more than anything just communicating and, and settling the defense and and you know maybe pumping him up when he needs to do that too he's just a he's a great voice to have behind you chase and the entire defense put up a phenomenal effort a couple of saturdays ago was a 7-5 win over maryland to lock up the outright regular season title for the first time since your program joined the big 10 at least in an outright fashion Peter, you pointed out to me before we began this interview, 127th all-time meeting between you and the Terps. What is that rivalry like, and what were those final seconds like for you to watch the clock count down, knowing what you guys had just accomplished? Uh, you know, that game really stands alone uh, in your season. It's always going to be the biggest game for us. We have a lot of rivalries. This is a you know historic program. Um, that, you know, has a, a lot of strong competitions with different uh, different programs. But the Maryland one's always going to be unique in its own way. Um, it's an exciting environment, uh, passionate fan base on both sides. You know, we pack the stadium and uh, just a, a really great experience for our guys. But to, to come out um, on top, I think, was pretty special. Uh, the, the Big Ten implications factored in, but they just they don't outweigh the, the rivalry that we have with Maryland and it's uh, it's a great one it's it's you know great experience for the guys to see a real playoff like atmosphere um, even with a game that was you know deciding between the first and second place in our conference it had every bit of a you know final four like atmosphere so it was great uh, Peter when you and I first spoke I believe it was a year or two ago I learned you were a Rochester New York native spent some time there we discussed the greatness of the Nick Tahoe garbage plate. I'm curious, what was on the victory night menu after that win over Maryland? Uh, what did we have? Uh, I don't know. There's tacos, burritos, or something like that. There's something so they can grab and uh, and keep moving and, and doesn't get doesn't get messy. But uh, I can't remember what we had. I, I probably was right up to the um, to the meeting room with the staff and things like that. But. Uh, um, and they all probably went out to eat afterwards anyway, so they, they it feels like they eat every 20 minutes. So, <laughs> Yeah, I have a, a growing teen boy. In fact, they do eat every 20 to 25 minutes. I see it in the bill. And I guarantee you, no matter what it was, that meal tasted a little extra special for your team. Obviously, as the league's top tourney seed, you earn a spot into the semifinals. You'll face Michigan. It's a team you beat 15-11 just about a month ago. What's the scouting report right now on the Wolverines? Uh, they've been playing well. They're really tough in the middle of the field. They got a great faceoff guy, um, you know, um, performing well in the middle uh, rides and clears. Um, they seem to put the ball on the ground a lot. Uh, they have some some really talented, skilled offensive players, um, you know, high level shooters, things like that. So, um, you know, like I said, they've been playing well. They're they're a very well coached team. Uh, we know we're going to have our hands full in every facet. So, um, you know, just trying to get through the basics and, and make sure we're we're buttoned up before we get there on Thursday. How are the guys doing with that extended wait? It's great to get a little bit of extra rest as the top seed, but it also means you have to wait a pretty long time between your final regular season game and the semifinals in the tournament. Yeah, sometimes you feel like it can, um, you know, change your tempo a little bit. So we, we tried to make last week as much of a game-like environment as we could. Um, so it didn't feel like we, we had an off week, you know, setting up some uh, in-practice competitions and things like that. And, um, you know, we had a similar scenario last season where we had a buy, and I think maybe we took our foot off the gas a little too much. So try not to do that this year and, and you know, appropriately balance recovery and rest time with uh, with the attention to uh, getting better. And so 
uh, you know, we'll see how it translates. Um, I thought the guys stayed focused. I thought they did a good job, continuing to push. Like I said, it's a, it's a very senior heavy group and I think we got, you know, good leadership in there. So um, hoping to get it, uh, you know, dialed the right way before game day. Peter Milliman, head coach of the Johns Hopkins Blue Jays and the Big Ten Coach of the Year. Johns Hopkins opening up the Big Ten Tournament semifinals, 6 Eastern, right here on the Big Ten Network against Michigan. Peter, we appreciate the time. Best of luck to you and the guys this week. Thank you very much. We are back to feel the draft after the break. Dave returns with an inside look at an amazing Wolverine-centric weekend as the defending champs steal the show in Detroit Rock City. Your big stat, fueled by Gatorade, recaps a big weekend for Michigan. No other school in the country had more players chosen in this year's draft than the Wolverines. 13 different former Michigan players heard their names called. Penn State was second most in the Big Ten. Illinois, Iowa, and Ohio State, each with four players, drafted this past weekend in Detroit. Back with Dave Wanstead, we talked a little bit about J.J. McCarthy, the top Michigan player off the board. You had other guys go, Chris Jenkins, Trevor Keegan, some later round picks. Roman Wilson was a fascinating selection. Here's a guy that I think got better at his position every single year in Ann Arbor, became kind of a go-to guy for J.J. McCarthy, has a lot of different skills, kind of a unique set for a wideout. Yeah, I agree with you, Rick. You know, uh, I talked to the people in Pittsburgh after they drafted him, and they feel like they got a steal. I mean, because I think that Roman, because of the offense that they ran at Michigan and the limited opportunities and not a big passing team, Didn't have to go downfield all that often. Didn't have to get down. Didn't have to do a lot of stuff to win games. Uh, that, that a lot of people kind of slighted him a little bit. So I, I do know this, that he's in Pittsburgh and – you know, Russell Wilson and the company back there, they're excited to have him on this football team. He's going to make an impact. You watch what happens. Seven of those 13 Michigan players go in the first round. That shows you just how deep and talented this team was. So the backside of that is you wonder what's left. Sharon Moore takes over. There'll be a new quarterback. There's no Blake Corum. There's no Roman Wilson. A bunch of the top defensive guys, Mike Sanders still, Chris Jenkins, they're off to the NFL as well, the expectations won't change, but realistically, what should we expect for Michigan? Well, um, you know, I don't, philosophy wise, I don't think there's going to be much change. You know, you just said it right there, but the recruiting base right now, and they can use this to their favor, to their advantage. You know, you say, hey, we are running a system that's a pro system on offense, a pro system on defense. We're going to develop you. Our staff is going to develop you. Look at all the pros. Look, look at the guys, how they love our players at Michigan. Yes, everybody wants to be associated with a winner, and we're going to yep. win, but we're also going to put you in a position where you can be NFL ready. And, that, and that's what the word is out there, and it's, it's all relative. I mean, yeah, 13 players drafted. you got a lot of talent. The players are developed, and he wins a championship. Georgia last year uh, – at national championship. I think they had 14, 15 players drafted. Same as Michigan, you know, and, and that's why when I look at Ohio State, right, four players drafted. Ryan Day did a heck of a job. He's got the nucleus of his team coming back, and he didn't have 13 guys drafted. He, he had a small group, which tells me it's a young team. Uh, most of them are going to be coming back, plus transfers and, yep. and recruits. And, and, to, and to play like they did and get the wins that they did, that's a heck of a job. People don't want to hear that, but from a coach's perspective, I know Ryan did a good job last year with the players that he had. Well, you also have to remember, obviously, one very high draft pick. And speaking of high draft picks, I think I may have said seven Michigan players in the first round, of course, in the first three rounds, seven of those 13 picks. But to Ohio State, yes, four picks in this year's draft. But there's at least a half a dozen guys who, if they had been in yep. this year's draft and decided to forego their remaining eligibility, we could have been looking at somewhere more in the neighborhood of 10 picks for the Buckeyes. Absolutely. absolutely. And, uh, and they've had them in the past. So uh, it, it's, it won't be a setback. It's going to make, make a huge difference in a good way, I think, this year. Yeah, and I, I'm with you. I know Ryan Day takes a lot of heat. And listen, when you're the Ohio State coach, he doesn't back away from this. He says, we have to beat Michigan. Yep. We have to win the Big Ten. We haven't done either of those things in the last three years. He understands that's on him, the staff, and the 2024 team to try to reverse that trend. All right, Kurt Warner, Warren Moon, John Randall, Tony Romo, Antonio Gates. What do they all have in common? None heard their names called in the draft. Up next, Dave, on which undrafted free agents could become most valuable players from this year's class. 
Time for us to take you around the Big Ten, and the dynasty continues in Columbus. For the 17th time in program history, Ohio State is your Big Ten tournament champion. Ty Tucker has just built an absolute monster at OSU. Michigan women's tennis, not far behind. The Wolverines keep rolling as well as Michigan women's tennis claims the Big Ten tournament title for the third consecutive season. What a weekend it was for the maize and blue across a couple of different sports. And at Scioto Country Club, also in Columbus, is a great story from the Big Ten Men's Golf Championships. Northwestern wins both the individual and team titles. Daniel Svard taking home medalist honors for the Cats as David Ingalls and Northwestern also wins the team title. There was the draft this past week, and then there are undrafted free agents, and then there's even another level that I wasn't sure I'm even aware of. Talia Tungavailoa, former Maryland quarterback, has been invited to Seattle Seahawks camp, but not signed by the Hawks for a rookie tryout. Now, other players have actually been signed to different squads, and we'll get to those in just a little bit. This is such a unique situation for Leah. He has a chance to go in there and prove that he is worth signing, but also, if I'm him, if I'm the quarterback, I'll say, I'll try out, but I don't want to get hit because I don't want to get hurt. i got to be ready for another team if you don't sign me. Well, they're looking for something. We would have these, and it's very difficult. It's usually a player that somebody likes, and you'd hope to sign them, but there's something in there, a red flag that you want to check out. So uh, if you can get the player to come in like Leah's doing, uh, it gives him a possible opportunity. If you want to play in the NFL, you got to do what you got to do. I'm not sure how this is a detriment to Seattle. You bring him in, you're not paying him really any money. You're probably Plane playing ticket. per diem, plane yep. ticket, maybe a day worth of yep. a, a salary to be there and try out. We'll obviously update you, see if Leah is able to make the roster. Uh, other players who were undrafted did sign with teams. Isaiah Williams, who is a terrific wide receiver with Illinois over the last couple of years. You remember, you, you think back to his start of his career in Champaign, he came in as a quarterback. Yep. Transition to wide receiver, so he's he's fairly raw there. A lot of ceiling upside for Williams. He has signed with the Detroit Lions. He did, and he got a lot of money. I mean, he's got about as much money. And we had him slated as like a fourth-round draft pick. You know, big 80 catches a year for two years in a row. Team captain. I mean, all he checked all the boxes, except maybe he wasn't as big as some of these guys, height-wise. So that hurt him, but they want him. When they, when they give you up over – I mean, he got a lot of money. A couple hundred thousand, supposedly, is the talk – Guaranteed money as a free agent, that's better than being drafted in a sixth round. Well, uh, and a lot of folks will say sometimes it is better to be undrafted than to go in the sixth or seventh round because then you get to pick and choose which yep. team you think fits your skill set the best. Maybe Williams sees that with the Detroit Lions and, and a very different look under Dan Campbell and obviously a team that's on an upward trajectory. Uh, Aaron Casey, the linebacker from Indiana, really productive. I guess the questions with Casey is the lack of athleticism, and can he overcome that to still be productive in the NFL? Yeah, and, and um, that's exactly it, you know, but he's going to get a chance, get in there at camp. Uh, obviously, we know all the stats, first team, you know, Big Ten, you know, tackles for loss, led the Big Ten. He's going to have to make an impact on special teams, Rick. You know what I mean? Mm. Because they're probably not going to put him in a lot of situations where he's going to get a lot of playing time, early as a linebacker, but every time they say, you know, who can cover a kickoff, coach, I can do it. Who can uh, cover a punt, coach, I can do it. So special teams will be the key. When we look back on Casey, whether he makes it with the Bengals or not, it'll come down to special teams. Yeah, you also got to make some plays early in this rookie camp because yep. you're going up against other rookies. Those oh, yeah. are the guys that you need to beat out for their spot. You need to go from the jump. Let me take you back to your coaching days. What do you remember about this time? The draft is over, yeah, and you're crazy. sitting there with your guys, <laughs> and you're thinking, what holes do we have to fill, and what undrafted free agents are we looking at? Because there are still a million guys out there for the taking. Absolutely. And, and picture it this way. You're a scout. I'm, I'm a position coach. You have one or two players that you really fell in love with that you know are going to be late-round picks. I've got one or two that, that I really love. So when we would get down to about the sixth round, I would team up guys scout with a coach and they would go in and start calling their play you'd call your guy i call mine and say i hope you get drafted but if you don't we want to sign you here as a free agent and you know me as a coach i'm going to give you a chance to make the team you're saying the same thing but to a different kid picture it so this is all going on now the draft is over and they and i call everybody in real quick and say here's the board this is the 25 to 50 thousand names Okay, me and the GM would do it. This is 50 to 75. Anything over 100, you got to come and check with us. 
So go to it. And they would go in there. You'd be calling your guy. I'd be calling my guy. The best recruiters. So hold on. Get, During the draft, it's still going on. Oh, they're working you have the phone. coaches calling players. Yes. To tell them that they're going to be undrafted free agents if they're not picked. Don't you feel a little bit bad? The kid yes. picks up the phone and he thinks to himself, I'm about to get drafted. Coach. And you're telling him, hold on, we may or may not want you after the draft is you over. You think Michigan doesn't talk to kids and then not offer them a scholarship, but then they get them on the rebound. So it's all about recruiting and, and, and laying groundwork and building a relationship. That's what it all comes down to. I'm telling you, free agency, it's crazy for about two hours in there with the scouts and everybody – Coach, if I can get 10 more thousand, I, I can get We're him. talking about all the phone calls. Nobody's making calls anymore. They're texting all these guys. Nobody's on the phone. I'm on the phone, Coach. I'm well, on. well I, I don't want to say it, but you know what I'm going to say. For Dave and all of our guests, I'm Rick, and we really appreciate you hanging with us on this edition of Big Ten Today. Make a call.